Let me greet all of you in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. I want to thank the choir for that beautiful music, beautiful item of, uh, of worship, and uh, may God bless you. And I want to welcome those who probably are joining us this week for the first time. I don't think you have missed much, um, so it's okay. Um, and we want to welcome those who might also be on different social media who are also probably part of this, or who will watch this later. I want to thank our technical team for the good work they are doing, just to ensure that this message does not just remain here in, at Solusi, is not confined uh, within the walls of Solusi, that it goes everywhere. So we, you're just as, as, as important to the spreading of this message as the preacher is. So if you do a bad work there, it showed you work, I'm in trouble. So we thank God for the work that you are doing. And before we start, uh, I want to say to you that at the end of our sermon, um, it has already been made that uh, uh, there will be baptism, but I'm going to be really calling you to make serious decision. Um, basically, three decisions, and I'll start with a difficult one. Um, so I want you to pray for that. This is our last um, meeting together, not our last meeting on earth, but that's also possible, but this is our last meeting together. One of the decisions we have to make, and the first one we need to pray for, is to pray for people who call themselves Christians and Adventists, who are not really, really living up to the name, in many ways, privately or, or whatever. And um, once in a while, we, I know it's embarrassing. There's nothing as embarrassing as actually try preaching to pastors and ask them to, to stand up if they are not serious about Christianity. No one stands up because it's embarrassing. So the most difficult thing is to be a Christian and um, find that you probably are not walking as you're supposed to. So most of the people who are going to be lost are those who call themselves Christians. If you go to the book of Matthew 7, 
And those were Christians who says, but we did this and that and that. And he says, I never knew you. Those were not the, the guys from the beer hall or guys who abused drugs. Those were religious people. And uh, so we want to ask those, not just people who want to rededicate themselves, we will come to that, but people who feel like, you know what, I think I need to take this thing seriously and I need to be consistent in my work. And there are issues that I really that keep coming up in my work that make it difficult for me to walk as fast as I can. And that happens to most of us. And you get a chance today to say, Lord, I, I, I really mean what I said a few years ago. I want to, to live for you. Help me. And you will know those issues. It's not just general. You know the issues that you are facing. And the second group we're going to be talking to are those who really need to to stand up and, uh, and be baptized. And that one also is a challenge because you feel like you owe it to others. Uh, you want to pretend as if things are okay with you or that you are strong and courageous by not standing up. It's a sign of weakness. So we want to encourage you to pray that the Lord will help you to stand and uh, uh, respond to the message. As you have heard, if you have not heard, you don't have to stand because then that's that's even more confusing to yourself. But if you know this is what you need to do, it has been coming up for some time now, and you kept this, the, the, uh, postponing and delaying, now you feel, this is it, I've got to make this. Um, do that, it, it is always uh, a blessing to make that commitment. And, and, and the last group are those who would like to thank God for the revival, and would like to be an instrument in his hands as they also seek to revive others. Um, so that's going to be the last group. And I must say to you that I have been revived. Uh, my preaching, whenever I go, is selfish. I always say, what's in it for me? What am I going to get? So when I preach, I also want to be blessed. If I'm not going to be blessed, I'm not going to preach. I promise you. I've got, even in the preparation of the sermon, I must feel like, you know what, if I had not come to Solusi, there's no way I would have known this. No way. So that my coming has revealed certain things I've taken for granted, certain uh, concepts I did not fully understand. But because I was given this opportunity to stand, it has helped me to clarify that in my mind. So I go home, and my wife is going to see a new husband. I say, what happened to my old husband? So he died there in Bulawayo. This one is a new one. Amen. I want you to take your Bibles. Um, I'm not sure if you do carry your Bibles. I haven't seen quite a few of you uh, having Bibles. I know you might have them in your cell phone. Um, but let me see those who've got Bibles. It's just, mine is not very new. Um, all right, most of you don't. All right? Okay, so you can just note the verse down and then one day when you manage to buy a Bible, you can go and read them. I'm going to read from Acts 17, verse 30 to verse 34. It reads as follows, because he was appointed, sorry, verse 30, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now com commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. And among them was Dionysius, the Areopagat, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So just a few handful um, in all this uh, discussion or presentation, a handful was able to respond. And what we want to look at today is, uh, um, the title is God's Assurance of Salvation, the Evidence, sorry, God's Assurance of Judgment the evidence that God is going to judge this world. We're going to be looking at that. 
the evidence that God indeed is going to judge this world. Let us pray together. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you that we can stand here behind this pulpit where many men and women, Lord, have stood and preached your word. And may we, dear Father, in faithfulness do the same. Bless us now. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Those of you who were here yesterday, you will remember that we said the coming of Christ, we have serious evidence for the coming of Christ. And, 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 and we are looking at Daniel chapter 2, that at every change of government, at every change of kingdom, there in that transitional period, when it moves to the other, there's a mini judgment that takes place. And God judges the previous kingdom as he ushers in the new kingdom. And he gives it to whomsoever he, he chooses. And it goes, when that kingdom also has reached its, 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 its point of no return, God judges uh, that kingdom and takes that kingdom and gives it to another. And we say that's what happens right through until the end where God judges the last kingdom and take that kingdom away from that. And then now, because uh, he has been doing that all these years, this time around he gives it to his son. And it's the kingdom of righteousness that stands forever. This morning, what I want us to do, which is going to be a little bit challenging, um, so I'm going to ask you to walk with me. Don't leave me behind. And I won't leave you behind and that is the evidence that God is going to judge this world. God wants to speak to us in terms that are reasonable. He doesn't want to hide his truth in words. He wanted to be so clear so that no one will have an excuse. I've heard people say the Bible is difficult to read. Why would God give us the Bible? That's the only way for us to be saved and make it difficult. I think the people who make the Bible difficult are the preachers. Umama Ole Cholocho reading this word is sure to go to heaven with no training. It's reading the word of God. It's not for the scholars. The scholars sometimes make it more difficult. So we've read the text in Acts 17, um, verse 30 to 32. Um, and this is the message, the, 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 the nucleus, the core. This is what Paul wanted to portray. And we're going to be looking at that. There are three things there in that message that are very important, maybe four. But the first one is the call to repentance to everyone. The second one, the reason for that call, which is judgment. And the last one is um, the evidence for judgment, which is what we want to look at. And then, of course, the last one was the response to that. Let me just say a little bit about Athens, this, where Paul was. If you look at uh, chapter 17, starting from verse 16, it says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens. So Paul was at Athens, and uh, Athens was given, as you read in verse 16, over to many idols. If you read the Andrew's Bible commentary, it says, Athens was forested with temples. It's like temples were like forest. There were so many temples, actually... Uh, one person, one writer uh, symbolized this in a, a satirical way and he said, in Athens it is easier to find gods than to find a man. Athens was known for its love of philosophy, love of wisdom. So as you see there in verse 18, there, uh, at least there at Athens, as, as it says there in that text, there were two schools, the Epicurean school and the Stoics. Those were schools of philosophy, and they were different. You see, the, 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 the Epicureans were your atheists. You remember during the week we spoke about the Epicurean paradox. Those were the guys who says, if God is loving, if God is all wise, if God is all powerful, why do we have evil? There is no God. And that has come through for all these years and known as the Epicurean paradox. So the Epicureans who were there in the audience of Paul, this is very important. This background is important because it's going to determine how we understand the content of Paul's message based on who he was addressing. So let's look at the audience because your message is tailor-made to the audience. If I go to Cholocho, I will, I will change the way I preach. 
But if I'm at Solusi, I've got to change because of, because of the audience. And sometimes you miss the mark even, even when you try to do that. So the Epicureans were basically all atheists. They didn't believe in God. To them, the chief end of existence, of human existence, was pleasure. Let's just enjoy yourself and eat and be merry for tomorrow we die. Those were the Epicureans. Always sitting there talking philosophy and trying to find the latest fad and the latest fashion on, on when it comes to pleasure. And then you had your Stoics. Stoics had serious, it, actually Stoics is, was more pop, popular than, than Epicureans. And um, Stoics were pantheists. They were, they were worshipping many gods or pantheists like um, uh, they, they uh, more like your polytheists but not exactly but they believed in, 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 in many gods. And, and they are, their goal was pride, uh, passionless existence. And the Stoics did not um, acknowledge the fact that we, we, we have to feel. And it's a beautiful uh, people that you can learn. Uh, I know it says of uh, one of uh, Mandela, one of his favorite books uh, was actually from a guy known as Aurelius, who was a Stoic. And so Paul at this time is on this Mars Hill, Areopagus, um, where Socrates, one of the Greek philosophers, was actually killed for his contention, for his arguments that were not popular at that time. And some of the people were afraid that Paul would meet the same fate because he was bringing things that were new and strange as far as the Greeks were concerned. So the Stoics, who were actually the more religious ones, uh, as Paul observed, he even says, I notice that you are religious because you've got altars of all your gods, of many gods. You even have an altar of an unknown god. You are saying, in case we have forgotten another god that we don't know, let's create an unknown altar for an unknown, sorry, an altar for an unknown god. So that even the unknown God is accommodated. You see, that's the thing about polytheism. You, you have no problem absorbing gods. You just allocate them. Hinduism has no problem. Oh, Jesus is God, also bring him. They have no issue. So this guy says, we are worshiping in case there's one that we've forgotten. Let's have an altar. And so Paul says, you know what? I'm going to talk to you about the unknown God. He says, this one, the one you worship unknowingly, the one you worship without knowing, is the one I came to proclaim. And at the end of the message, Paul seems to be saying, this is the... This God who is unknown is the only one who must be worshipped. Paul was bold, but as you would see, his approach was not the best. So we'll critique his approach as well, but within the Bible, not outside of the Bible. Uh, and you will see how we do it, all right? And so Paul argues as he, as he goes through with his presentation, um, trying to meet logic with logic, philosophy with philosophy. He says, God has made, this unknown God has made the whole world and everything in it. And listen to his logic. He says, if God has made everything in the world, therefore this God does not need you to support him. Unlike your gods here, these other gods who are actually confined in temples. If God has created everything, you can't confine him in a temple. And it does not even need human hands for sustenance. And some of us, when we return to us, we think we are blessing God. God must be happy now. I gave him one dollar. And then he moves on. He says, God has made from one blood every nation on the face of the earth. And something we need to remember all the time when we are um, sinking in our ethnocentrism, thinking that your tribe is the closest to God. That God has made everyone from one blood. I may speak a different language, but I, we come from the same blood. One blood. Don't use language to make you think that you are better than the other person. And then he moves on to say, well, he's offspring. Therefore, now, I mean, they even quote their uh, 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 literature, those, they are literalists, those people who, the poet, uh, he calls their famous poet, he says, we are his offspring. If we are God's offspring, how then do you carve? How do you create? How do you make gods out of stone and wood? And then you say you are the offspring. How can you be an offspring of something you have made? He's actually showing all kinds of self-contradiction in their worship. 
And you can see that they are following him. But then he gets to the point which he was trying to get to. He says, as I've read here, he says, truly these times of ignorance God has overlooked. It's over now. There's no time for ignorance. That time is over. Now God commands all men everywhere to repent. He says it's over with all these gods that you have. The times of ignorance where you are worshipping all these gods. It's over. It's not time to play now. Go for the unknown. Alone. Only. He's the only God. And then he says, the reason why you need to repent, you've got to watch how Paul puts it. The reason why you need to repent, sometimes we don't know, we just call people to repent, and you say, why must I repent? You say, oh, let me think. But the reason why you need to repent is because God is going to judge this world. So, at the pinnacle there is judgment. You see, that's the direction, that's the destination. That's where we are all going. We are all going to stand before God's throne. That's what God is going to do. Now, God has been patient for years, thousands of years. When Adam ate, he should have been judged, but God has delayed. But he says, I've set a date, a day when I'm going to do it. So now, there's going to be judgment. That's, where, that's what's going to happen. Then he says, because there's going to be judgment, you must repent. So repentance is actually occasioned or made more significant because there's judgment. So repentance is not a joke. It is because judgment is not a joke. So repent because there's judgment. In other words, what you do, be careful because there's somebody who's going to judge and evaluate everything you do. Now, he's, he raises that argument and then he says, uh, in case some of you think that judgment is just a, fi a figment of my imagination, God has given assurance he has given us evidence that he's going to judge. So you see those three things. Judgment. Sorry. Repentance. Judgment. Resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ helps you to understand that there will be judgment. And when you understand there's going to be judgment, then the need for rep repentance is accentuated then you see the need for repentance. You see, you see what is happening? So we argue through resurrection so you can see the importance of judgment. And once you see the importance of judgment, you see the relevance of, of repentance. Does that make sense? All right. Now, let's look at the, 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 the Stoics. Uh, let's look at the Stoics. Remember, we spoke about the Stoics who actually were the, poly, the pantheist, those who had all those gods. Let's look at the, the, the Stoics here. Ordinarily, the Stoics who believed in many gods would have a problem with repentance. Because they have a problem with repentance and they have a problem with repentance because they have an issue with judgment. And they have an issue with judgment because they don't believe in resurrection. You see, the problem with Stoics, if you're going to win the Stoics, you've got to use resurrection to get to them. You've got to prove to them that there's something called resurrection. Once you do that, then they are open to the fact that if there's resurrection, then judgment is possible. And if they see the possibility of judgment, then they see the relevance of repentance. Here's the thing. In, 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 in with, 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 with these gods, with this religion, uh, even though we may take it for granted, there was no connection between your faith in God and how you live. Philosophy would take care of how you live. God you had to do with worship, that's all. Worshiping your God and how you live are not connected. You don't say, because I worship God, therefore I must live this way. No, those are, are, are disconnected. When you worship God, you're doing things for God to appease and to please him. That's all. It doesn't say, this is how I should live. There's no connection. You see, the contribution of Christianity was to connect your behavior, your ethics to God. To say you must love God and then love your neighbor. So that loving your neighbor is a reflection of your love to God. That is new. That is unknown. I mean, we know, for example, that there were so many goddesses in the Greek um, religion. And these goddesses, the worship of these goddesses was connected to many demoralizing rites and ceremonies. I mean, these goddesses of, of sex, goddess of fertility, goddess of this. Now, temple prostitution was part of worship. So, you closer to God, the more prostitute you are, the more closer you are to God. 
That's how terrible these religions were. So when Paul, when Paul says it's time for repentance, he means it's time to move away from that. But how are they going to move away? By knowing that there's a God who's going to judge. In other words, he's moving them from the gods who don't care about how they behave to a God who cares. And he says that God is separate, is unique. He's the one who raised Jesus from death. If you have any other God that has done that, then let's look at it. But there's only one God, the unknown God, who has done that. Of course, uh, your Stoics did not believe in, in resurrection, as I, as I said, including the Epicureans. They didn't believe in resurrection. That is why when Paul was summoned, the main reason why Paul was called, was summoned to come and talk to them, was to address the issue of resurrection. So resurrection, now this is beautiful. Now those of you who are doing theology, this may even be more interesting to you. See, see here's the thing. So the Stoics and the Epicureans are different. Others are believers, others are not believers. But they agree on the issue of, of resurrection. It is of interest to both of them. All right, resurrection is important to the Stoics, it is important to the Epicureans. Now, if, if Paul can establish the fact of resurrection, the Stoics might actually want to repent. If he can, if he can make the point for, oh, you're not with me. If he can make the point for resurrection, the Epicureans might actually say, maybe God exists. You see, the atheists did not believe in the existence of God, the Picturians. So there is no God, therefore, no need for repentance, therefore, no judgment. So no God, no judgment, no repentance. Now, Paul says, through resurrection, we can establish that God exists because it is God who raised Christ and there is no one who can raise the dead. So if the Epicureans could see that and understand it, that actually it's God who raised Christ, therefore God exists. Now if God exists, if God exists, then what Christ says about God must be listened to. And Christ says God is going to judge. So they must actually take, pay, pay attention to that. Not only that, therefore they must align their ways to the will of this God who will judge. So repentance becomes important. To them, there was no need for repentance. The Greeks, all you needed to do was to do philosophy and science. And then you will attain elevation and honor. But both of them were curious about repentance. If God is going to judge the world, then their lives must be aligned to this God. So here's my, <laughs> this is dangerous, here's my critique of Paul's approach. Um, this is, I mean, if both the Epicureans and the Stoics have interest in resurrection, then you should have made the resurrection the main point of your argument. And, and Paul didn't. Paul did not do that. All right, stay with me. Don't sleep now because if you sleep at this point, you're going to miss a lot. Then you can sleep after. Paul. Paul mentions. Now, I'm even reluctant to say this. Paul doesn't even mention the name of Christ. He says he has appointed a man. But he's talking to the Greeks. Who's that man? He has appointed. I could say a man here. You'd understand. He's, he has appointed a man whom he has ordained. And he has given assurance of this to all by raising him. <laughs> Who? Now you've mentioned your second time talking about this. Those were important, but you should have spent time on resurrection. You can't just say he has given evidence of resurrection. Stay on resurrection, Paul. Because that's the interest for both groups. Are you, are you, are you with me here? Okay, and I know what you are saying, Pastor Papu, I, you're critiquing the Bible now. Remember, this is inspired. All right, let me use the inspired Bible to critique Paul. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2, Paul says, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now that is resurrection. Because Christianity is not just about the crucified Lord, but the risen Lord. Now, why is Paul mentioning this? Remember, immediately, 
after Athens, he went to Corinth. And when he landed in Corinth, he says, I'm going to change my method now. Uh, my pastor says, I'm going to change my method. I don't think I was effective in Athens. Immediately in Corinth, he evaluates. What we are doing now, Paul did. He says, now I'm focusing on Christ. No more calling him this man. No more just resurrection and passing. I'm going to stay on resurrection. And for those of you who still feel like, no, pastor, you're confusing us. Let me read from Ellen G. White, Acts of the Apostles 244. It reads as follows. Paul realized that his teaching in Athens had been productive of but little fruit. He decided to follow another plan of labor in Corinth. In his efforts to arrest the attention of the careless and the indifferent, he determined to avoid elaborate arguments and discussions and not to know anything among the Corinthians save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And when you speak like that, you are basically saying, let's talk about the resurrection. Now that is why in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul devotes the whole chapter on resurrection. Something he did not do in, uh, um, in, in, in Acts 17. There it was just a line. By the way, 1 Corinthians 15 is the longest chapter in both books. It, it is about 58 or 59 verses. It's the longest chapter. Just on resurrection. Because Paul had seen that this is where we need to touch on. And I want to tell you something, beloved. Today, 2,000 years later, resurrection is the key. And sometimes I get worried because we don't spend much time either thinking and reflecting on this and, and, uh, than we're supposed to. If you just Google, out of curiosity, you see how many people have been led to Christianity just through resurrection. Just by, by proving and understanding and, and, and testing resurrection, how many of them have become moved from atheism, Epicureans, to Christianity. It's so amazing the number of, um, the, I mean, if you go to Google or YouTube or books in the library, how many scholars are interested in resurrection? Because once you can lock that, God's existence is no longer an issue. In this text, Paul says resurrection can be proven. It can be attested. It was a historical event. We can prove it. I can't prove God's existence. I can just lead, point to evidence. But resurrection, you can prove because it's historical. By the way, it is easier to talk about the resurrection of Christ and the, 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 the figure of Christ more than Caesar. There are, there's more literature on Christ's existence than Caesar. Than all the other ancient figures. There's more writings on Jesus, ancient manuscripts on Jesus than all others. So here, you don't even have to be a believer. We just let's read history. That's all. You don't even have to read the Bible, extra biblical material on Jesus. Even those who are opposed to Christianity will accept that. And that is, Christ lived on earth. There was a time when the people were looking for the historical Jesus. Christ lived on earth is attested to even by non-biblical authors that Christ lived on earth. There was a person called Christ. Now we had a privilege, um, you were there, we had the privilege to visit Jerusalem. And the interesting thing in Jerusalem, you've got tour guides who take you around. This is where the 5,000 people were fed. This is where Jesus Christ turned water into wine. This is where Jesus Christ was born. You're taken to Nazareth, you're taken to Bethlehem. You take him to Galilee, you take him to the Sea of Galilee, you get onto the boat. But the person who's leading you is not a Christian. Because he's a historian. This is history. He's talking about history. He does not need to say, yeah, it's inspired. No, it's history. He has read history. He doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. But he knows that Jesus Christ was a person. He did this. He was popular. He was charismatic. It's history. They can even point you to the tomb. This is where he was buried. 
Sometimes, of course, the argument is which one? There's one in the garden uh, just above the text ring. There's one inside the uh, Jerusalem. The, the, the confusion is which one? But both are empty. So to the Jews, it's not an issue that Jesus Christ lived. They just don't accept him as a Messiah. Of course, Islam, Muslims, accept Jesus that he lived was one of the prophets, Muhammad being the last one. But of course, they are very cunning in that. Uh, I mean, Islam comes 500, about 700 later, and they argue that Christ did not die. He was taken to heaven. Well, you can't come up with that 700 later, 700 years later. You can't have that information when you've got evidence prior to that. But their argument was that Christ didn't die. Actually, the guy from Cyrene probably is the one who died on the cross. Whoever died on the cross and rose on Sunday is our savior. Now, because Paul has spent time with 1 Corinthians, let's go there. Because he didn't give us much in X. Now, let's go to the converted Paul in terms of his methodology. And then 1 Corinthians 15. Amen? Am I still an Adventist? All right. First Corinthians chapter 15, he spends the, we're not going to read every part of the, of the story there. We're going to run out of time. Here he says in verse 3 and 4, Christ died. He says, I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. So we remember Paul is the last one to, to, be, to become part of the disciples. Now that Christ died, this is a tradition, it's known, it's, it is not contested that Christ died. Everybody knows that he lived and he died. There's no miracle in dying. So we have to have a dead Christ for us to have a resurrected Christ. And so he puts it, Christ died. Not only did he die, he was buried. Because if Christ was not buried, you can't go to a tomb and say the tomb is empty when he was not buried. So Christ died and he was buried. You affirm those two, you're opening your hole now. You're opening, you're opening the, the possibility of an empty tomb. Because there's a person who died, there's a person who's buried. Alright? So Christ died, he was buried according to scripture. You see, what is even beautiful about this event of Christ's death and burial? is that it was prophesied. It is not just a historical event. It was a historical event that was prophesied before it took place so that when it takes place, you know there's significance. I don't think there was a prophecy that I'll be at Solusi at this, during this weekend, but it has become part of history. But it would have been more powerful if we could read a document in the library saying, August, what's the date now? May, what's, what's nice, is it June? I can't remember, but I think it's somewhere there. Uh, in May 28 to 22nd to 28, there will be a man who used to stay in South Africa, but from Kenya, who's going to be preaching here. You discover that, that it was known before I came, my coming becomes even more important. So it's not just history, it, it is history that was expected. And that's the death and the, and the resurrection of Christ. Now here is the most powerful argument <laughs> for the resurrection of Christ. Most powerful. He was seen. Full stop. Now remember, in case you get lost, what are we trying to do here? We're saying resurrection is the assurance that God is going to judge. If you can establish resurrection, then judgment becomes possible and repentance becomes relevant. Are we together? All right. So I'm saying, uh, powerful um, choir members, I'm saying that uh, the powerful argument here is that he was seen. He was seen. And the whole argument of resurrection uh, revolves around this aspect. He was seen. Now, we could argue that there was an empty tomb. But if there's an empty tomb and no Jesus who's seen, empty tomb is meaningless. So, if you have an... Now, follow me. You have a Christ who dies, who's buried in a tomb of Joseph, and all of that can be attested, by the way. In the tomb of Joseph, you go, the tomb is empty, then Jesus is seen. Okay. So, the one who died was buried. We didn't see him resurrect. We just saw an empty tomb. And then we saw him. So if he was in the tomb 
and now the tomb is empty and we see him, then he has resurrected. So, I mean, that's how we argue. You're not going to say, but did you see him resurrected? No, no, I don't have to. All I need is an empty tomb and a person was in the tomb who's alive. Then he has resurrected. I mean, how else can it be? In the tomb, no one in the tomb. Seen, that means he has resurrected. I mean, even the primary kids would agree with that logic. Of course, it is true, not everybody saw him. But it doesn't become true when everybody has seen him. All we have to argue is, who has seen him? Do you know that things are there even if you have not seen them? They don't become there until you see them. Papu was at Solushi. No, but I did not see him. It can't be true. Hi, Wena. Just find out who saw him. <laughs> did you see him? Yes, I was there. Did you see him? Okay, he was there. You don't have to see him also. Make sense? Uh, you could argue and say 2,000 years later, but, but Tina Lai Cholocho. <laughs> we, <laughs> sorry about Cholocho. <laughs> you see, Cholocho was mentioned with Canada, so. so <laughs> it's very important. You can't argue and say, Tina Lai Cholocho, Askambon. Tina Mazulu. We don't reason like that in life. Ask who has seen him. They have heard, but they did not see him. Now remember, the, the story of the resurrection of Christ did not start to surface 2,000 years later. It surfaced during that few days so that those who did not believe could go to the tomb and just point to the body in the tomb. So if you hear that Christ is risen, you have not seen him, all you have to do, take a walk to the grave. And say, He is here. Find the body. Destroy the argument. I was watching a documentary some few years ago I picked it in the, in the middle, the documentary, and I wish I could find it, I don't know, but the documentary was that people there in the documentary who were acting were looking for the body of Christ. Because it was believed that it was stolen. If you have stolen the body, you must dump it somewhere. They were looking for that body, looking for people who may have done it, persecuting people, torturing them. We want the body up until at the end of the documentary, they didn't find the body. And the answer is, he was seen. Now Paul argues, and he says, he was seen by Cephas. That's Peter. Now Peter is the one who denied him. It's important who saw him. You see, you see, because, because it's easy to see, if, you see there's something called a, a confirmation bias. It is easy to see what you are looking for. It is easy to see somebody you, you, you have, I mean, you would like to see. Peter, the last person Peter would like to see is, Jesus, is a resurrected Jesus. That is why when Christ rose, says, tell Peter also. So Paul says, Peter saw him. Peter saw him and the twelve. And then he says, after that, he is giving us evidence. After that, he was seen by the 500 all at the same time. Now, you might wonder, when was that all at the same time? On, 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 in Galilee, there on that mountain with no name, in Galilee, when the gospel commission was given, Ellen says there were more than 500 who were gathered there. They all saw him, 500. You bring that argument to a judge, case closed. You bring 500 witnesses, 500, all saying the same thing, case closed. He even says, this is Paul now, oh, he even says, some of them are still alive. 
you can go and ask them. <laughs> go and ask them. He moves on and he says, James, James, why is he mentioning names? James was the brother, and James had issues with Christ. You know, there were, he was a half-brother of Christ. You know, the last thing you do as a half-brother is to believe that your brother, which you are older than, is, is, is a messiah. He's going to take forever. Lendwana, the messiah, Lendwana, heaven. This little boy, the messiah, my sibling, is, it, it's difficult to believe. You know, I, I've been preaching at home, and I'm a pastor, but for them, it's like, ah, John Impi, hey, soga, move away. I mean, it's no big issue. It was going, now if James, yeah. the elder brother, yeah. saw him, yeah. there's credibility there. Yeah. And then he says, of course, if you mention the 12, we have to include Thomas. <laughs> Thomas had an issue with this resurrected Jesus. He says, ah, hey, 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 They came and said, we saw that, ah, 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 ah. You ask Thomas, he says, I saw him. And then Paul ends up by saying, I saw him too. He doesn't start with himself. He says, I saw him too. He was seen. Now, my question is, how do you account for that? Let's say you don't believe Christ resurrected. How do you account? Now, listen, you may not believe he resurrected, but at least you should believe that the disciples believed that he resurrected. Now, if the record says they saw, you must prove to us and tell us what they saw. You can't say they did not see. No, you can't say. You can't say that. Because they say they saw. So you must then say, no, 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 no. You know what you actually saw? Uh, heh, 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 heh. That's what you saw. And that's what scholars have been trying to do over the years. Trying to understand what they probably saw. Now, before we get to that, <clears throat> the Jews, when they heard that Christ is risen, you know what they did? They said to the, to the soldiers, please go and say the disciples came while you were sleeping and stole his body. You see, you don't follow the argument right there. This is where as a lawyer you say, okay, all right, so you saw the, you saw the disciples stealing the body. Yes, okay. And what was your state? I was sleeping. Okay, and then, and then the argument says, so you saw the disciples stealing the body in your sleep. And then you say, yes. He says, no further questions, your honor. <laughs> but we could even, we could even stress that. We could even tease that a little bit and say, how is it possible that the disciples would steal a body Go hide it somewhere, come back and say he's risen. And even be willing to die for that. Who dies for his lies? Now, no, okay, okay. You could die for a lie because you've been deceived, but who dies for his own lies? You can die for your lie because I think it's the truth that I'm deceived. Are, are you following me? Then I can, yeah. They say he is risen enough. But who creates a lie? And say, Jesus is risen. Even if you kill me, I'll be risen also. When you know you're lying. It's like this guy who was selling a car. And he said, this car has done a lot of mileage. 400,000. Like my old jet, I've done over half a million. But we sold it even at that. So we didn't do any trick, tricks there. But this guy, what he did was to reverse the mileage and put it around 80,000 from 500,000. 80,000. And then he sells the car. He says, I mean, the first thing you do when you want to buy a second-hand car like a poor person, what's the mileage? And the guy says, 80,000. But yet, reversed it. 80,000. You know, the guy who was selling the car and saying it has done 80,000 actually decided not to sell the car because he felt that this car is still new. It's 80,000.
Now, that's, now that logic is, is huge, it's deep, it's profound. When you believe your own lie and put your life on it. But ordinarily, that does not happen. How do you steal and claim he's resurrected while you are struggling to believe in the resurrection yourself? I mean, on the day of resurrection, Christ had to convince the two guys who are on their way to a mouse. How do you steal and still need to be convinced? Christ had to convince them. He had to appear. He had to do this. They did not. How do you steal in order to create a lie which you don't even believe yourself? That's very important. That argument, by the way, is very important. I like, I was listening to Bart Ehrman. Some of you could just Google Bart Ehrman. He was, he, he's very deep when it comes to uh, about historical Jesus. He writes, he's a well-known scholar when it comes to analyzing all the documents and the manuscript. He goes forever. He's, he's just attracted so many people. He's so intelligent. He's involved in so many debates. One, in one of his debates, he says, now this guy studied a lot of documents and he will show you what's confusing that this one does not agree with this one. Uh, I'm not going to be, I'm, I'm not critiquing him now. So he says, when, when the question is asked, but who, who did they see? He says, no, it is possible that Jesus had a twin brother. So what the disciples saw was a twin brother. But I mean, that makes sense. Twin brother look like. So at least you can, and yeah, they saw, but it was not the actual Jesus. It was a twin brother. Jesus Christ was dead. Bring the body of the other twin. And please show us evidence that there was a time when these twins were together. That they were twins. We can't talk about twins after resurrection. They should have been twins before resurrection also. We could go on and on with all theories of, hallucin of, 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 of resurrection. One of those is hallucination. hallucination. Hallucination basically says, you've taken a hallucinogen. You've taken something that makes your mind to create reality that's not there. So... <laughs> those of you who like some of us who took uh, benzene and whatever else and then you start seeing things that are not there <laughs> hey, 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 here's a lion he's coming for me <laughs> you, you, you begin to see things that are not there that's hallucination and it is caused by what you are actually inhaling so the argument for hallucination is all these 500 people, these 12, Paul and others, were hallucinating. People who have studied hallucination will disagree with that. You can't have many people seeing the same object in their hallucination. Even if they have imbibed the same hallucination. At different points. By the way, if all of us here say we saw Papu, all of us here, less than 500, we saw Papu preaching. And then someone says, no, but you are hallucinating. The one who's hallucinating is the one who says, you are hallucinating. <laughs> we can't all be dreaming. Here. We can't all be hallucinating. So the, otherwise, there will never be any evidence brought in court if you could always use the argument for hallucination. And we could mention all this and mention all this, but the point is, produce the body. We end the discussion, bring the body. He was seen. Beloved, resurrection is the main pillar of Christianity. And this is where we sometimes lose it. Resur without resurrection, there is no Christianity. Christianity was birthed after resurrection. When Christ died on Friday, there was no Christianity. Christianity began after resurrection. Good Friday was a bad Friday until resurrection. When you saw those guys walking to, to Emmaus, it was a bad Friday. And they said they killed our Savior. We thought he was the one who would actually bring liberation. They've killed him. When they realized his reason, Friday became a good Friday. You see, you see the meaning and the importance of, reason, of, of death of Christ is actually attached to the fact that he resurrected. You, so for you to understand the cross, you start on Sunday on the resurrection and move back and then understand the significance of the cross from resurrection. So if Christ is resurrected, then his death was purposeful, meaningful, and significant. Because he was the only one who rose. So his death, so you extrapolate from this. So his death must be actually, if Christ resurrected, then everything he said about himself is true. When he said, I and my father are one, 
When he said, I have been sent by my father, and he resurrects and he says, God has raised him, then actually his identity is, has become reliable. Not only that, if God has raised him, then God exists. So both the Epicureans and the Stoics are in trouble with the resurrection. It kills both of them. Well, by kill, I mean it convinces, <laughs> it convinces both of them. He becomes who he said he was. That is why the Jews did not want him to resurrect. That's why they had to put the stones and do everything. This guy must not resurrect. If he resurrects, we are in trouble. These guys couldn't even contain the bodily resurrection of, of, of Lazarus, which was not big, by the way, because he resurrected and died. That's not huge resurrection. That one is just coming back to life. It's not resurrection. It's Christ who resurrected. Because when he resurrected, he had a different body. That resurrection actually is our resurrection. When we rise again, we have resurrection bodies never to die again. That resurrection body did not need doors to enter. It just appeared and then disappeared. That's a resurrection body. Never again touched by death. That is why Paul says in that book, 1 Corinthians, he says, and he says, in a moment, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for, for, for the trumpet will sound, and, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we, we shall be changed. Lazarus was not changed. We shall be changed, and, 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 and the dead will be raised incorruptible. The corruptible must put on incorruption. Forever, never, even, ever after have a pimple in your face. That's the resurrection. And so, the message of resurrection is where we are. And that's what establishes the importance and the relevance of repentance. After resurrection, it's no longer business as usual. Eat and be merry. No, you can't. Tomorrow you're going to be resurrected. You can't say eat and be merry for tomorrow you die. Eat and be merry, tomorrow will be resurrected. Prof. Now, <clears throat> let me quickly dispense of this little thing as we wind towards the end. What if there's no resurrection? After all what I've said, what if there's no resurrection? You know those questions that look so profound when they are just empty? What if there's no resurrection? This is the time you wake the person you're sitting next to because this one is clearer and more understandable maybe than what I've said already. What if there's no resurrection? And the answer is you will not know. Nobody's going to prove that there's no resurrection. Because they'll all be dead. So you will never discover that you were deceived. It's not like after so many years of death, you said, ah, oh, gents. We are still sleeping. We were deceived. There's no resurrection. You want to know, so don't worry. If there's no resurrection, you want to know. Stop bothering yourself. <laughs> but the Bible says, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there's no resurrection? When resurrection takes place, we will all know. Oh, by the way, I could throw this for what it's worth and say, even if it can be shown that there's no resurrection, we would not have been disadvantaged by believing in the resurrection. Because resurrection improves the quality and the quantity of your life. It injects meaning to life. It is resurrection that makes you say, I'm going to wake up now and take a jog and do push-ups. It's resurrection. It's resurrection that says, you know what, I can't eat that. It's dangerous to my health. It's resurrection. Resurrection promotes life. It promotes health. It, el it elongates. It extends life. So even if it's not there, it's a good thing. It's a good lie. 
Give me resurrection any time. I'll take it. Beloved, now that we have placed this, put this platform of resurrection, when resurrection takes place, we will know that is judgment. When the trump shall sound, the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive together with them will be caught up in the cloud. You want to know what happens when that cloud reaches its destination? And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. I'm reading Revelation 20, verse, starting from verse 4. And, 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 and for the word of Jesus and the word of God, he uh, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not, had not received his mark on their foreheads and on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. In other words, not only will there be judgment, it looks like we're going to be part of that. We will also, before some of you go to hell, we will vote for you. How many are those who say all agreed? I mean, because there'll be enough evidence. That's why it says, and the books were opened. They said they and judged. They looked at the cases that are about to be decided on, that Christ has already made up his mind on, reviewed all the cases, and voted for those cases. So that the destruction of the wicked is not something done privately by God. We are also part of it. And maybe one day we'll talk more about that on the judgment. But then verse 5 says, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So which means everybody is going to be resurrected. But the best is to be on the first resurrection. Blessed are those who are in the first. Second res res resurrection is over. You know, when, when, when John says, I, John, saw the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven, you mustn't see it. You must be in it. When you wake up and say, Pastor, I had a powerful dream. I saw New Jerusalem coming down. Then I said, you were lost, my brother. In your dream, you were lost. You were supposed to be in. That's why John had to say, I, John, not you. I, John. I, John, saw. Nobody else should see because John saw in a prophetic vision. But once you start seeing it, then you are in trouble. And then we, we read, after the thousand years, then I saw the, the dead, the small and the great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of love. Now, this is judgment, and they were judged according to their works. So what you do, your works matter. How you treat your brother matters, because when judgment is done, they will look at that. How did you treat your wife, elder, pastor, deacon, not how did you preach? It's nice to preach and go up and down. When I go home to meet my wife, then God starts looking. He said, I, I appreciate what you did in Solus. Let's see what you're going to do at your home. That's why some of us run away from home. We want to be conducting campaigns forever. We don't want to go home. Because that's where religion is. It's at home, not behind the pulpit. Religion is what your kids see, not what the members see. When your children can say, my father is a Christian, then that's religion. Not, my, not this pastor is a, is a... You know what my boys say? I've got two boys, 32 and 30, almost. I've been with them for all their lives. In the car, in the bus, in the plane, wherever. They have never, not once, said, Daddy, that sermon was good. Never. I mean, I would be sweating and I get into the car, it's quiet. My wife says, thank you, honey. That was beautiful. You know, women are just amazing. Even if you didn't make it, it's like, that was good. <laughs> Encouraging you. And then later, it says, but you know, next time, and then you know we are in trouble. All right, but the boys will never say a thing. Hey, dad, hurry up, we're hungry. Hey, boy. What's wrong with these boys? Nah, 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 nothing. You know what? They are watching me. How does he treat our mother? They don't care about my sermon. How does he treat our mother? When the boys call me, they don't say, where were you preaching? They say, where's mom? Where's mom? 
To them, what matters is not my sermons. To them, what matters is that I'm their father and I listen and I'm there. I'm patient. I'm there. I'm kind. I'm peaceful. That's what matters to them. That's the greatest sermon that can be preached. A loving and a lovable father. So your works, what you do, you will be judged. Some of the leaders in the church don't understand that. Some of us who are in the leadership, we don't understand that. I was a president, I know what I'm talking about. It's nice to have power and you can really run around and make people miserable, but you will answer. So there's no hiding in death. You can't hide in death. You can't mess up and decide to die. You'll be resurrected. I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was a stranger. I was naked, sick, and in prison. And you did not do anything. Depart from me, cast into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But I preached a sermon. I don't care. I was hungry. I was hungry. But I was preaching. I was hungry. That's Jesus identifying himself with those who are poor. So what do I say to you, beloved? Like the question that was asked, how do I say to my father who was away, forgive him. Vengeance belongs to God. He will take vengeance. Relax. It's under control. Let's finish with repentance. The message of repentance makes sense both to the Stoics and the Picurian. If resurrection is true, then judgment is inevitable and repentance is necessary. To the philosophers and the idolaters who had no regard for humanity, the message is clear. Repent so you can connect with your brother. Repent so you can love your neighbor. Repent so you can love your enemy. To repent is to accept God's love so you can love your enemies. Love God's people. It is a failure to love your neighbor, your enemy, that brings you into judgment. To repent is to worship God. Give your heart to him so you can be available for your neighbor, for your spouse, for your children, for your colleagues, for your classmates. Repentance is to know Jesus. He's the one who will sit on the judgment. And in the end, Paul makes two appeals when he closes. Remember those three things, repentance, judgment, and, and, and the evidence. And we've started with evidence, with resurrection. We spend more time there to actually say this judgment is real. And if judgment is real, then repentance is important and necessary. And then we read at the end of the, of the message, and this is where we end as well. At the end of the message, this is what we read. Because you have forgotten now. It says, and when they, had, uh, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead... Some mocked, ridicule. Some of you, I hope you will not do that and ridicule me. Look at that guy, his tie. Look at his hair, ridicule. Because whatever you hear, one day you will also face it. Some mocked, ridicule. While others says, we'll hear you again on another time. Others postponed. Yeah, maybe next week. Now let me give, let me give you some time. Sometimes they say war avoided is war postponed. Procrastination is the thief of time. If you have heard it now, why do you postpone? Today, if you hear his word, if you hear his voice, accept it. But then there's a nice part. It says, however, some men joined him and believed. And among those was Dionysius, the Areopagite. And a woman called Damaris. Want to see those people when you go to heaven? Damaris, are you Damaris? We read about you in the book of Acts. Yes, I was one of those who accepted the message when Paul preached. Of course, those were not the only two. Luke says, and others with them. So I end on those three. Which one do you choose today? To ridicule, to postpone, or to accept? Now, in that text, in 1 Corinthians, Paul makes two appeals. The first one is, which is the last one, in verse 58, be steadfast, beloved, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, I want to say to those of you who maybe are going through difficulties, you feel like, what's the point? A friend of mine died of liver, liver cirrhosis, whatever you call it, and he never drank, he never did anything. He was always clean, exercising, doing his work. 
Most of his brothers would drink and they were drinking like you won't believe, but they didn't die of liver. He died of liver. Before he died, he says, what wrong did I do? What wrong did I do? I never drank, but I'm dying out of liver. You know, there are times where you go through life like that and you say, but why, why? Why am I dying? Why am I in this situation when I've been so faithful to God? And Paul says, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Your labor in the Lord is not in vain. There's judgment. Judgment is promised. And the second appeal he makes in the same text, he says, awake to righteousness and do not sin. Repent. Do not be deceived. Whatever a man sows, that he shall reap. And I end with these words. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world but lose his own soul? That time has come for us to pray and to make a decision. I've made mine. It's time for you to make yours. And the first one that I want to raise to you now, uh, this is where you're going to come in a blessing. The first one I'm going to make to you now is those of you, I'm not just making a general appeal here, those of you who know deep down in their hearts, if Christ were to come now, even though you are baptized, you know where you would go. I'm not saying you are a bad person. I'm just saying you know where you would go because there are things there that you have not set right. I remember when one of my relatives was sick to death and we spoke with my wife and say, this has a chance to set his life straight. That's not right to speak like that. Your life must always be straight. You don't have to wait until the doctor says you've got three days to live. And then he says, let me go and ask for forgiveness. Let me go and do this. <clears throat> that must always be there. And I'm, not, I'm going to make that appeal directly now to those. There may be one or two that say, you know what? I don't care who says what. Me, I want to go to heaven. I've said that to my wife more than many a times. That I may be making blunders, my wife, and this and that. But I promise you, dear me, I want to go to heaven and I'm going there. So, so if you are going to heaven, you've got the ability to self-correct just because you are serious about heaven. You are able to repent. And that's the call I'm making. And if you are in that group, I want you to raise your hand and say, I am in that group. I need, and I'm, this is not for all of us, guys. Honestly, it's just for the few that says, really, honestly, really, God work with me. And it's not a big thing. Sometimes it's just the inability to forgive someone. It says, I can't. I can't, for instance, I can't forgive him. It's not like you are a witch, you are, you are, you are bewitching people who are involved in witchcraft. It's just that I can't, I cannot. But the lack of forgiveness is witchcraft. Because before long, you're going to be planning to kill that person. That's why you need to ask God to give you the power to forgive. I'm just using forgiveness here as an example. So Lord, please help me. Yes, they look at me, they see a preacher, they see somebody who's organized, but I know there are issues. If they're not sorted out, I'm in trouble. I want you to stand where you are. Just stand. Those of you who have your hands up, stand. Alright, I'm going to make another appeal to those who say, you know what? If resurrection is true, then judgment is true. It's time to come back home. I want to be baptized so I can be ready to face the judgment. If that is your prayer, that's how it starts. You raise your hand. You know where it's going. If that's the prayer, you, if that, sorry, if that is your prayer, you raise your hand where you are. That this is it. I want to walk with Christ. I want to start a new walk with Christ. Even to some of you who are standing, you may actually be wanting to make that decision, by the way. It's not all for those who are sitting down. You may actually say, you know what? I'm standing because I want to accept Christ as my personal servant and be baptized publicly, uh, uh, acknowledge God as the ruler in my life and the ruler in this, in, this, in this planet. Let's see your hands, those who are part of that decision. Those who are saying, this is it. Just raise your hand where you are. Those who are saying, this is it. Um, I'm giving my life over to Jesus. It's over. There's no time. And I was saying to someone, 
that when you make that decision, by the way, you don't even need to consult your friend. All you do, you send an SMS. It's over. And the person will know. Even if there was an appointment in the afternoon to go somewhere to do something, I'm no longer coming. Something has just happened here in church. So that appointment, four o'clock appointment, has been cancelled. I'm not going there unless it's going to preach or whatever. But I'm not going for that appointment because when I made that appointment, I was not what I am now. I'm a different person now. A different person sets new appointments, makes new engagements, plan for new events. Some of these things come off and that's why sometimes it can be a challenge because now your diary, there are certain things in your diary that you must cancel. Certain plans and appointments and, and whatever else, cancel, 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 cancel. I'm not going there. I'm not going to be part of that. And if you want to be part of that group, I want you to raise your hand and I'm going to invite you to stand with us. And those of you who are already standing, I want you to see your hand if you're going to be part of that group. Do we have people here who say, I want to be part of that group who are standing? I don't see anyone. Are there people here who are saying, I want to be part of that group who are going to be part of the baptism this afternoon at three? Raise your hand. Or not necessarily part of the baptism, but who are going to be baptized. And some of you have said, but I don't want to be baptized this afternoon. I still have to talk to my mom. That's fine. But who are saying, I want to be baptized? Whether this afternoon or next afternoon, but I want to be baptized. Please raise your hand where you are. Those of you who know that you're not walking with Christ and you are sitting under my voice. This is the last time I'm making the appeal. You are sitting under my voice and you want to give your life over to Jesus today and walk a new walk in your life. Raise your hand and we're going to invite you to come forward. Thank you, my brother. God bless you. Even if you are the only one, it's worth it. And this is where I stop. Come forward, we're going to pray for you. Just come forward, take, make a way up forward. We're going to pray for you. This is it. We came here for you and that's it. That's where we end. And that, that hand that was up there, I didn't see there was a hand there. Please escort that person to come forward and then we're going to pray. Don't worry, don't, don't be afraid. You've already made a bold stand. I thought I saw a hand. It looks like it has disappeared. All right. Uh, once more, anyone who maybe he was just scratching somewhere, I thought it was a hand. Anyone who says, this is it, Pastor, I'm coming home where I belong. Come, my brother. What's up? Now read in the Bible that Christ would have come even for one person. Come forward and we're going to do this. God bless you, Madonna. Ma God bless you. I don't know whether you were here yesterday when I said, there's nothing as beautiful as seeing a young man giving himself to Christ. Then you know, less one rapist, less one criminal. God bless you. God bless you, Madonna. Ma Anyone who wants to join this group here, we're going to close. Anyone who wants to join and say, this is it. It, it. it comes to an end here. No more. I'm not going to be a play tool for the devil. It's over. We're cutting this thing now. No more engagement. We're cutting this thing. I'm free for Christ. Anyone who wants to come forward, we're going to pray. Anyone who wants to come, Come for this, we're going to pray. I was telling the pastor about a youngster. He was this age. How old are you, my boy? Eight. He was about nine years old. Here in Bulawayo, so many years ago, he wanted to be baptized and the pastor said no he's, he's, he's too young he cried they tested him he knew everything they said we are too young i met that boy a few years later he was studying in south africa at one of the universities wearing all kinds of things he was never baptized never 
He's old now to be baptized, I think. He was young to be baptized. Now he's old to be baptized. He never. I don't know whether he actually did. I haven't met him. I would like to see him. But I know where it started. So we don't look at those decisions for granted. The parents must caution, must, must admonish, bring up the kids, make sure they understand and walk with them. The devil has no age. He rapes even the youngest. If they give themselves to Christ, if they are making a mistake, I'd rather fall on that side than on the other side. God bless you, my little one. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. He also wants to give his life to Christ. Let's look at those hands and take care of them. We're going to pray. Come for this. Let us pray. Our Father, our God, we have come to the end of this special week that has been set aside for you to talk to us. Talk to our situations, talk to our predicaments, talk to every concern that we are experiencing on this other side of heaven. Pastor Papu has done what you had entrusted him to do. Songs have been sung. Prayers have uh, been presented. We have cried, we have mourned. And the last talk and the last message for this time has been given. We therefore conclude this was with fruits up front here. We just want to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Here are the outcomes of your powerful word. Results of your death. Results of your resurrection. Results of your coming. Accept these men and the women, these young people who have publicly acknowledged Jesus as Lord and Savior. Inside this temple, we still have men and the women who are in the decision of value. We pray God, we plead for them, we intercede for them. God, don't give them rest until they rest in Jesus. Father Jesus, shake their hearts, shake their life, shake my life and they allow me to make things right with you before probation closes. We thank you so much, God, for the ministry of Pastor Papu, the ministry of his family, the ministry of his wife, the ministry of his children, the ministry of everyone who is biologically related to him. As we pray now, we just want to remember his family and ask that God, as you prepare to come to this planet, begin with Pastor Papu, begin with his family. We join him as we all are willing to prepare for your second coming. Bless Solusi, faculty members, student body, members of the staff, SAS, administration, everyone, guests that are here, our virtual viewers who have been supporting, praying, listening to you, God, wherever they are, Lord Jesus, bless each one of us. May goodness and mercy follow all of us and we are making a decision to stay in your presence. Watch over us, keep us till you come and take us home. This is my prayer in Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Our kind and loving Father, we are about to go to depart, but may we never depart from your presence. May your face continue to shine upon us. And those of us, Lord, who 
are faced with difficulties, even now as we speak, Lord, please attend to them, dear God. Bring comfort to their troubled soul. There's a lot of harm and pain and suffering that your children go through. And we don't want to take that for granted and just push them along. May you walk with them, Lord. May you heal where it's hurting. May you touch, Lord, where it's painful and be their comfort. We commit our lives to you. Even as we end this week of prayer, may this not be the end of our walk with you. And one day, Lord, when the skies burst, when the clouds bring that host of heaven and the angels, may we be there, Lord, to be part of that entourage on our way to our promised land. Bless us, Lord, and keep us faithful until that day. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.